JP Marceau, it's good to have you back on the channel. I hear that you have a course and a book coming out. I'm excited to talk about that. Uh, but first, let's just check in, man. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. It's been a while since we spoke. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to catch up. You've been doing some some really exciting things. And I'm, I'm just wondering um, if you could uh, just maybe elaborate on what you have coming up, and then we can maybe dive into those things in some more depth and then get into, I don't know, maybe zombies, uh, metaphysics, philosophy, solutions to the meaning crisis. How's that sound? Yeah, sounds good. So I have two um, big projects that are coming to fruition. So one is a, a book I assembled um, over the past few months. I tried to pull some of the best content I had put out in articles, podcasts, um, French and English, and uh, try to see what coherent narrative I could weave uh, through them to make one single book. And worked on that for a few months. Um, worked out well that Jonathan had started the Symbolic World Press. And um, I told him about the book project. And he was interested. In the end, the book is centered around the meaning crisis and how to solve it. And the line of attack I take is that we became reductionists, uh, materialists around the time of uh, the Renaissance. And this has spread like a zombie virus. And now we're trying to get out of it. And mm -hmm. I go through like fairly careful arguments to get people out of there. I try to aim it at people who are currently materialists uh, and trying to recover from that or were at least open to recovering from that. Um, so that's the main sort of project that is coming up. And before that, I also assembled a course um, that's going to start on uh, the 24th of January. It's going to run for five weeks, once a week, on the um, Symbolic World uh, Circle community. So uh, the, the, the course is going to go through the book material. And it's also gonna cover additional material for people who are already in the symbolic world community. I would say people who are willing to, to go a bit further, who don't necessarily just want to uh, get out of nihilism, but who are interested to go into the like little debates that um, are, let's say, more advanced and not necessary for most mm -hmm. people. So I think it's interesting stuff, but if I had put some of that material inside the book, some people might have found it weird or like unnecessary. So uh, the, the the class is going to be an opportunity to dive into those other interesting kinds of topics. Yeah, for those that are listening, uh, I am pulling up the details right now on the Symbolic World website. And the class starts very soon. So very soon after this is published and you're listening to it now so january 24th is the first day it's going to be on a wednesday it's going to be a series of five classes starting time is going to be three eastern time and the price is an affordable price of 125 dollars for the entire course uh, so i'm really excited about this i unfortunately will not be able to catch the live version because based on time zones i'm out at the edge of the world in california and i'll be working pretty uh vigorously at that time so i'll but have to catch the reruns yeah, yeah everything's okay, recorded that's what i want to hear and hopefully some other people appreciate that too so just in case you can't catch the live version um is it going to live on the symbolic world press website on the the circle so the you circle. can access okay. it through the the website but yeah it is gotcha. on the circle the big advantage is there's lots there of go. functionality inside the circle to um like have different channels for questions, uh, to have uh, channels dedicated to live streams. Um, so yeah, it's a pretty good platform so far. I it, My first time playing with it, but uh, I'd say it's going pretty well. I'm a big fan of the Circle platform. It's nice and clean. It's kind of a combination yeah. of Discord and Facebook groups. Yeah. But customizable. Yeah. It's... Uh not a whole lot of distraction either. And the cool thing is that you don't have to be a financial supporter to log into the community. As I understand it, 
says mm -hmm. that you can engage in the community and post discussions as a free subscriber. So yeah. go ahead and check that out. But of course, if you find value in the content, go ahead and support Jonathan and JP and the whole Symbolic World gang, uh, if you so choose. Awesome. So, okay, so you have the book and the course. The book itself, when is that going to be scheduled for pre-release and the main release? Where can we find it? I'm, I'm not sure when it's going to be available, let's say, online. I think the we're still on track to start selling it at the summit. So uh, like late February, if people can make it there. Um, Are you going to be there in person, JP? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should be there. As will in I. Person. Nice. As will uh, I. I think it's going to be really fun. Cormac Jones, our friend, had the great idea of renting a house for... Um, like a bunch of people to spend uh the this the, our time together there so really that is fantastic that. news even awesome. more than the conferences i have to say i look forward to spending time with uh friends that i don't see often enough um we get to meet in person for the first time yeah yeah it's been Thank yeah that's that. true we never we never met in person i only met a handful of people when i went to pennsylvania uh last year and not many others so it's going to be nice uh and yeah the the book is going to come out there like the, that's the plan at least stuff could go wrong but the idea is to start selling the book there and uh later at some point it's going to be available uh through the symbolic world uh, website and later probably in other platforms as well and i just confirmed that there's still tickets available so folks if you want to be involved with the summit you get the opportunity of meeting both uh, JP and myself. Ooh, my, I just realized I uh, need to make a change here. And mm -hmm. the the really interesting thing is that there's going to be Jonathan Bajot, uh, Neil DeGrade, who's on the screen right here, and many, many others that's involved with this website and the uh, exciting things that are happening in this corner of the internet and abroad, people trying to help people discover purpose in the world, a deeper meaning, make sense of the world, uh, especially during these crazy times. I can't think of a more important mission to be part of. Uh, and for the first time ever, we actually get to assemble at a large scale in person. So I hope you guys make the investment for those that are interested and meet us in Florida. So, uh, JP, the is there going to be a physical copy of the book that we can get a little sneak peek at the summit? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the plan. The plan is to have physical copies available at the summit, um, and then people are going to be able to order them like at some point later through the site. But yeah, um, if all goes well, there will be physical copies sold uh, at the summit. Man, that is exciting. Okay, cool. Well, JP, why don't we talk about the journey of this book and the, the course? Uh, where did this whole thing start out? Was there something that happened in your life? Was there something that you're wrestling with? Like, What was the genesis? Well, I mean, it, it's kind of twofold because on like the, the book itself as a project came up as a like the, a desire to assemble the best of what I had done and package it for uh, others in um, some readily accessible way, some high quality way, let's say. Um, so I had time to do that. And then for the material itself, um, it's mainly responding to questions that I add here and there and writing articles or doing podcasts allowed me to work through those ideas. Um, and yeah, it's all about the meaning crisis and then getting out of it. I would say if there's a narrative I see sort of looking back, um, that's uh, what it was initially like most people i think um coming out of a scientific education i was just naturally a um reductionist materialist just mm -hmm. seeing things in terms of articles um even people it was hard for me to see people as something other than just sets of particles that blindly follow right. equations um, by the way I, I so on the screen folks i i went ahead and pulled up a blast from the past, one of the very first articles on the blog that JP was an editor for for many years, Rediscovering Forms, very first one. 
almost four years ago. I think it was the second article on the blog. The first one was uh, like an introduction by Jonathan and then uh, this came up. So, you know, I just came back to this one, your third one on perception. Nice. Uh, nice. Still one of my favorites. Uh, I've been working more on the arrival analysis and mm -hmm. it's a huge part of understanding what's happening in that story. And yeah. so I, I come back to this one. Also one that uh, uh, David did, David Brodeur, similar topic on perception, but he used different material. Yeah. yeah. So, anyway. yeah, there's that. And also there's there are articles I wrote elsewhere uh, in French for a, a local Catholic magazine here and some stuff I had written for mm -hmm. my uh, my master's that was more directly on the errors of materialism. Um, but in the end, like what happened throughout the years is like the, the main thread I would say was getting out of materialism towards a, a fully Christian worldview and like the stops, the best stops in the end. I explored many paths, but I'd say the best path in the end, the cleanest one is from reductionistic materialism which is like a a naive but kind of bad um worldview for people who like science um you start from there you you show how it's limited and then you go to non-reductionists kind of naturalisms stuff that john Ricci would argue for um mm -hmm. but you can also see aristotelians and platonists uh, in general arguing for something like this and then from there you can go to christian metaphysics um there what i liked the most in terms of argumentation was lewis's book miracles um mm -hmm. i thought that was the clearest articulation of like a, a christian worldview that um I think like the, the key argumentation there is that rather than trying to justify Christianity by something lower, uh, let's say give historical proofs of this or that, which which has its place, but if you if you keep just trying to let's say use this very specific technical track to argue for Christianity, there's a big danger of reducing Christianity to that technical track that you're employing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm more of a fan of what Lewis does, which is to take the pattern of the incarnation and try to use it to explain everything lower. Mm -hmm. So um, it ends up not being, let's say, a definitive forensic kind of argument, uh, because in fact, if you do that, you're reducing Christianity to like a forensic kind of question. Um, you know, JP, I was reflecting on uh, miracles mm -hmm. because I read uh, one of the short stories by Dostoevsky, Notes mm -hmm. from the Underground. Mm -hmm. And uh, it uh, is really interesting. It, it it follows that argument, but narratively through like mm -hmm. this uh, more of like a fictional memoir. Mm -hmm. And for him, it all came down to what two plus two equals four. And its whole world of trying to say that you can or can't say that. And what does it mean? And mm -hmm. trying to bend it to where it's like, well, there is no objective truth. And his simplest uh, example of that was the math equation. Uh, two plus two equals four. Kind of like explaining natural law. Or it's like, it's dangerous when we try to reduce everything to quantity as well. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, it was just like. Okay, so you mean like the, the main character, it's been years since I read that, so you mean the main character tries to use 2 plus 2 equals 4 as his frame to interpret all of reality? Yes. Yeah, okay, it, okay. It, he almost uses it like a noun. <laughs> 2 plus 2 equals 4 is like, is, is it becomes a name that That's symbolizes, you know, some interesting things happening. And uh, it's almost like he planted a seed that was watered by Lewis and kind of grew into the miracles argument. At least mm -hmm. that's what I'm picking up on. Yeah, I wonder where Lewis got the idea from, but I think I think it's really powerful because it, in addition to making good um, philosophical sense, and it can be a surprising kind of argument philosophically, um, if we're used to always hearing things being justified like in a single way using lower level uh argumentation but um actually whenever you propose something radically new that's what you have to do you have to ask people to grant you 
something higher. That seems crazy at first, but then you show how if you accept this, then you can get all of what you had before and more stuff. So that's how let's say science goes from paradigm to paradigm. Like if someone proposes something radically new, let's say um, relativity theory by Einstein or um, gravity by Newton, whenever mm -hmm. pro people proposed new theories, they were treated as like, insane and they were rejected initially on philosophical grounds uh, people didn't think that their theories were like possible because they didn't fit within the current metaphysics but what they said instead was okay just grant me my theory with my new entities and then i'll explain to you everything that you have at the moment and more so um if you are dealing with a radical world you shift like going from classical metaphysics or uh, non reductive naturalism to Christianity. It's that kind of radical world you shift. So I think for it, you need to ask people to grant you something higher. Let's say the pattern mm -hmm. of the incarnation. And then you show how you can use this to explain everything that people currently believe in and also more stuff. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what I use for, um, let's say, the that, that's sort of the last place I want to bring people to. But... After talking about miracles, I so I make use of some of the work I had done on mir on miracles uh, three four years ago, and I build on it to um, go to ultimately a very direct solution to the mini crisis. Um, but it's I'm still building on that same idea of using the pattern of the incarnation to explain everything. Um, the one thing that um, I like to focus on sort of as the final argument against materialism is that I answer a question that the, the materialist couldn't answer, that the classical metaphysician couldn't answer, and that the non-reductive naturalist couldn't answer, which is the intrinsic nature of things. Um, that's a mystery in physical science at the moment. Physical science tells you how things behave. It gives you all kinds of nice equations to describe things, uh, but it doesn't tell you what things are. Uh, you even if you know that let's say something has this mass or this charge all you really know is that if you fit this value in this equation then you'll get this conse consequence but you won't know what a mass or a charge or like any physical entity really is deep down right. beyond its behavior um mm -hmm. so that that's a total mystery in materialism it's still kind of a mystery in the classical tradition because in the classical tradition you can say that everything Every physical thing is a union of matter and form. So there's a pattern and potential that unite to create that one thing. But it's still mysterious. Like, why does this union happen? And um, like how it, 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 it's still mysterious why, let's say, forms and matter can cohere in the mm -hmm. classical worldview. People just have to say that it does. Um, it's sort of axioms you start with, but it remains mysterious, and especially when you get to something very far from human reality you're talking about let's say physical entities like quarks or leptons and so on like it's hard to say what they could possibly be um beyond the behavior that we observe so ultimately i try to answer that question uh with the christian neoplatonic take on everything which is that at its root everything is rooted in love and is growing in love towards mm. god so then i can see all of the ontological hierarchy in an image of the incarnation where let's say in the incarnation especially on the highest moment which is on the crucifixion you can see the let's say you can you can see the higher giving itself to the lower so you can see christ giving himself to all of creation so mm. the pattern giving himself down for right the world but you can also see how the body gives it gives itself itself up for uh, the head you can see how christ is offering all of creation as an offering uh, to the father and you can see how those two things are connected mm. it, they're, they're the same like the way that christ is the form of all of creation is also the way that he offers all of creation to the father so you have this meeting of like a form coming down matter coming up uh, that is justified in in love so it's going to be like Love. What do you mean justified in love? It's uh, like justified in, in the philosophical sense of we have an answer finally to why mm. matter comes down 
to uh, sorry to why forms come down, why matter goes up, um, and why there's this mysterious coherence that happens. Like, why is it that like everywhere you look in the physical world, you have this union of matter and form? That's very mm. mysterious. Like it, yeah. It, it 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 works. Like, why is it so stable? Why is there not just matter or not just forms? And why do they unite so reliably? Let's say, why do they make something interesting? Um, it, it's hard to see the point if you're in the classical tradition only. Can you uh, explain it more see... in the class, JP. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna explain that more in the class. Okay. Of course, it's it's All sort more of the... reason to sign up, folks. Just saying. <laughs> yeah, I mean th that's the more uh, let's say. Um, difficult kind of material that I don't fully cover in the book. I, I hint at it a little bit because I think it's a very powerful kind of response to materialism. Um, because I think if you're someone who love, really loves physical science, you're really going to want a, a solution to the question of the intrinsic nature of physical entities. It's sort of an annoying mystery. If you're a... Um, if you're interested in physical science in general. So having a nice, clean solution to this problem is very attractive. Um, like I a think mathematical it's why, solution in a way? Almost, like you can fit something into the mathematical equations. Mm. So it's like physics gives you all these nice equations that describe things, it, but it doesn't tell you what those things are. So that's, mm. that's kind of annoying. Um, and somehow the way that we fill those equations up has to fit also with us because... You, you can describe humans to a degree, like at least in theory, using equations. Like if you, it would be possible to create very, very complex equations to describe what happens in my whole body and how it interacts with the world. And I don't even want to deny that it's possible to do this in theory, but more interestingly, I want to say that, okay, there's an intrinsic nature to all of these equations. Like, even if, let's say, you could use an equation to predict that I'm going to do so-and-so, it doesn't tell you what I am deeply and why I do things. So let's say you might be able to use an equation one day to, ex to predict, let's say, what is the probability that I'm going to say this or that when I'm speaking to you, but it's not going to be the deep explanation of my desire to say this or that for this or that for this or that reason. Mm -hmm. um, you, ha you have to put something as the intrinsic nature of the equation, because the equation by nature only describes the extrinsic behavior of mm. things. So um, like I, I want something to put into the equations. Like I want to breathe fire into the equations somehow to use a mm. um, Stephen Hawking's phrase. So I, I do that in the, the last main chapter of, of the book. Um, I think it's in, like in my opinion, for people who are recovering from materialism, this is a a powerful line of argumentation because you can keep what you had before and that you loved in the physical science. Like you can mm. keep your equations and the way that they describe the world, but you just like breathe fire into them. So, um, you breathe fire into them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you like they, they they come alive. You you come alive and yeah, all the the particles it's... come alive too. So. Um, that's, I'd say the, the culmination of the book. And then what I do at the very end is just deal with the most important, uh, counter argument, because let's say if you introduce a new theory to explain phenomena, you for sure need to explain everything that was explained before. And you need to explain more stuff like I just did with, um, the intrinsic nature of physical entities, but you also need to not be making new mistakes. Like you, you need to be making fewer mistakes than what was going on before. So um, you must not be making false predictions hmm. in other terms. And the biggest objection to Christianity, especially if you bring up a metaphysics of, of love where everything material is love coming up, everything formal is love coming down and everything uniting is this union of bottom up and uh, top down love then you have to deal with the problem of people. So that's what I spend the conclusion mm. on. Um, so that's the main thrust of the book. Um, and all on all of those problems, I had published articles. I had, had discussions with people and podcasts uh, in French and in English. And 
like I was, I also had often explored many paths around these problems, I would say. So um, in the end, uh, during like the time I had to put, to put the book together, what I could do was to look at like this whole thing um, in like all the podcasts, the articles in French and English and see, okay, what was the best? Like in the end, what is the best path I can make out of all this um, based on what I think of the, the material, but also based on the reception that the material had. And in the end, I ended up um, owning in on, on seven articles, really, maybe eight or nine, but around seven or eight, I think, articles. And then I just had to like rewrite sections so that it fits together into one coherent okay. um, argument. Now, who would you say would be the best person to write or read this book? Like, who 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 are you trying to reach out to to, and you think the book would help them or help them see things in a in a different way? Yeah, I think the, I think it's for sure. Well, there are two kinds of publics. It could be either directly someone who is a um, materialist because of a scientific education and who is interested in seeing if there's an alternative or it could also be for people who are trying to communicate with those scientific kind of people um the the kind of pr prototypical person i had in my mind when assembling this and i think for most of the articles i wrote was um myself 10 years ago when i was mm. doing um like my undergrad or like late high school science classes and starting to see the world in terms of just like particles following laws and wondering like how that has implications for good and evil and how to live your life. What, what would you say would be the, the, the spark for all of this? I mean, I'm just thinking timing wise, uh, mm -hmm. before, maybe like right before you became editor of the symbolic world and introduced into that world, um, like, were you wrestling with something like, was like, were you, was all this started because you're trying to solve something? Yeah. I mean, um, I think it happened in two steps because when I know, when I knew that I was a materialist and it was worth looking for an answer, uh, for, for maybe an alternative, I was, uh, in, I was doing my undergrad. Um, I was doing mathematics and computer science at the time, um, especially mathematical logic and theoretical computer science. And um, at that point in my degree, like from the physics I had done and that I was still doing on the side for fun, I knew that, okay, we're all just particles that I can like map out using equations. Um, but also... I was a bit disappointed when I learned about the incompleteness theorems in mathematics and theoretical computer science that you can show about the limitations of mathematics and formal systems in general. So mm. I wasn't even sure that I could really trust what I had uh, learned like through math. So the so, so it was a very nihilistic kind of point mm. in my life where it looked like like the best kind of knowledge that I had coming from science told me that I like myself and everyone was just particles, but then I couldn't even really fully trust that because you can't trust formal systems that much. So it was worth exploring an alternative. Um, I didn't really expect there would be something else because I really thought that the like best kind of knowledge was uh, reductionist kind of physics, uh, but I thought it was worth exploring something else because there's literally nothing to lose. Like if we're all just particles, then like, just spend your time however you want because you're just particles. So mm -hmm. um, then I went in and did um, a master's in philosophy of mind, trying to see if there were chinks in the materialist armor. So you, went was from, very... you went from mathematics what? to philosophy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's actually like an easy transition to make for um, oh, interesting. in most universities because How's that? philosophy departments are very wide like there's philosophy of physics there's philosophy of biology there's uh ethics there's a philosophy of law like there's philosophy of everything so in most graduate programs they're gonna let you 
start in like one branch pretty much you might have to do like prep courses to learn a little bit more about philosophy in general but by and large you'll be able to jump into a graduate program pretty quickly so um that's what i did because going from math and computer science with a also side background in physics it was pretty easy to go into philosophy of mind um so uh, I was able to jump in pretty quick. I think I only had to do take like six prep classes and then I was able to begin my, my research. So uh, I spent, it, but it wasn't very long before I saw that materialism didn't work. Like in philosophy, uh, already at the time, I think it's even more true now, but at the time there were really like way fewer materialists than they were let's say 30 or 40 years ago there are just too many good arguments against materialism now um so that was already helping quite a bit and uh during the time of those classes i became friends with jonathan because i had seen him on jordan's channel and jordan was doing interesting stuff about meaning that was a bit relevant to what i was doing so i had taken the time to study him a little bit and then jonathan um and like I w became interested again in Christianity through Jordan and Jonathan and also some of the works that they suggested. Like reading Paradise Lost was had a very strong impact on me. Just the beauty of this book and how it could show me moral patterns in the world was very uh, transformative and attractive towards Christianity for me. And also other stuff like the Gulag Archipelago was also very impressive, seeing the moral transformations that can happen in people and the strength uh, that religion can give to some people. So anyway, there were a few threads pulling me back to to Christianity, and I'd say I'd um, by the end of my masters, in um, I have to check it's before I, I started making YouTube videos. So that must be like around five years ago. I was very stable. Like I I felt like uh, I had solved the questions I had I really wanted to solve. Um, I I wasn't quite. I didn't have classical. Christian metaphysics yet, I would say. Like, I was still coming from... I was still largely panpsychist due to uh, what I was doing in my master's. Uh, panpsychists think that everything is conscious to some degree at some layer. So maybe not the whole table is conscious in front of me, let's say, but its particles probably are. So mm -hmm. um, I had... I was sort of trying to see how I could fit Christianity with that somehow, but I was going to church already. I was nesting myself in a community already. Uh, so like I, I was making, I think like very good uh, progress in my own life. I could see that I was leading a much better life than before. And I was like pretty firmly on, on my path already. I wasn't really expecting to uh, do a lot more philosophy and theology. Um, but I just wanted to put out a few videos on what I had learned in my master's for people who might be going through the same thing, mm -hmm. because there were a few problems I felt like could be fixed pretty quickly, but I had, I hadn't seen anyone fixing them quickly. Like I had, you had to read like so many books to be able to answer just a few questions. So right. I thought I'm just going to make a few videos to answer this. Um, and, but around that time, um, I ended up speaking with, um, Paul Vanderklay. I was supporting him on Patreon and then he would have those chats uh, every now and then with Patreon. So I, mm. I spoke with him, brought up John Verviki because I had used some of his works and I wasn't in full agreement with some of his points. But John ended up watching that conversation and then we spoke. And then that was the genesis right. of, I'd say, the second arc in my story because John poked many good holes in uh, my uh, mm. my my worldview at that time yeah so then it took me i'd say two three years to um learn a bunch of new ideas that allow me to answer john correctly and what happened really is like i would speak with jonathan at least once a month um through patreon mm -hmm. and also at, we became friends and at some point we started doing a French podcast and we spoke also for other reasons. So anyways, like I spoke with Jonathan fairly often, mainly in private. And on the other side, I also spoke with John Rariki, um a few times a year, like especially in the first year, we spoke like every few months, mm -hmm. uh, I think. Um, so I would run arguments by both Jonathan and John. And what happened over time is I became um, 
more of a classical Christian, like a classical mm. Christian Neoplatonist, I would say. Um, so yeah, when you guys first uh, started speaking, I, I remember you wrote an early article about zombies, and it was John Verbeke who also did work with zombies. Uh, I think it was a theme at the time because Jonathan Bajot had a really good uh, talk that he published uh, mm -hmm. that was also around zombies in the apocalypse. So, um, yeah, I mean, how I did zombies factor into this? Yeah, I didn't publish anything myself on zombies at the time. I think oh, was that I the published... podcast then? Um, I think what happened is, um, I don't know which came up first, but I, I was having zombie nightmares while I, when I was doing my master's because zombies are a, a symbol of uh, nihilism and materialism. So I had no idea at the time. I just thought I was angry or something. From? You just started having nightmares? Yeah, yeah. I, every every night I would have zombie nightmares all night uh, for about the first year of my master's. And it makes sense because... Wait, every night for a whole materialism. year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, that's yeah. haunting. It's not as bad as it seems because what happened is um, after a while, you know that you're just dreaming. So mm -hmm. you're not that afraid. It's kind of like a video game at this stage. You know that mm -hmm. before you actually get eaten, you can sort of just kind of shut down and then you'll respawn mm -hmm. in the next dream. So I wouldn't even wake up that much. Uh, often I would just go from dream to dream. Um, so it doesn't seem that bad. And often I would have powers. Like, I don't know, maybe I could fly or maybe I could uh, like move things with my mind. Um, cool. Stuff that has to do with the power of ideas, I think. So, um, oh, right. Because they eat brains then you can have like uh, mind powers or psychic powers. Yeah, I think it's, it has to do with the fact that like zombies, yeah, as you say, they, they eat brains. They're a symbol of materialism that is trying to devour all systems of meaning, um, which mm. is why zombies, yeah. like they just roam without a goal. They don't they have, have no telos, no purpose. Exactly. They have no community also. They have nothing to bind them together. They're just superficially right. following the same desires. Yeah. So they end up like roaming in packs, but um, they it's have fallen nothing. into randomness. Yeah, exactly. Uh, they're just following yeah. very primitive desires because that's all that's left if you're a materialist. Like you're just following impulses. Uh, you're just a Darwinian monkey trying mm. to uh, eat and um, that's it. So there's all kinds of parallels you can make. I had no idea at the time. I just knew that I was having those nightmares and uh, it didn't bother me that much. So you had the nightmares before you knew anything about what the others were publishing about zombies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Interesting. Yeah. But then at some point, I don't know who I saw first talk about it. Maybe it was John. Um, I... <laughs> It might have been John who I saw first, I think, post something on zombies that I found um, compelling, like explaining the relationship between nihilism and uh, mm. zombies. I think back then, I because I had left materialism behind, I was already having way fewer zombie nightmares on my side. Mm. But then at some point, Jonathan mentioned zombies in one of his videos. Um, it, it wasn't like a full talk he gave on zombies. He, he gave that later, I remember. But uh, he gave something where he mentioned zombies. And then I commented in the video that uh, John Rivicki had made a good video on zombies. So I um, posted the link. Uh, Jonathan watched it. I also talked with Jonathan about my zombie nightmares through uh, Patreon. And then mm -hmm. he made another, I think he, when he made uh, Pentecost for the Zombie Apocalypse, I think that was after we spoke. Um, so it, he, was he really in, talking to you, JP? In part, yeah. In, in part, I think. Yeah. yeah. In part, in part, it was talking about me. Um, and I, even if you, I think before John and Jonathan spoke, uh, I had told Jonathan because in the introduction he says he says it uh, that uh, like there's a uh, someone who talked with, yeah, there's some there's a friend he talked with who uh, had solved the zombie nightmare problem through Jonathan and John's work. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, that was so I had, I had never done anything directly myself about zombies, but I had talked about it with Jonathan quite a bit. We had worked out a solution um, just within ourselves um, because I had cut down my zombie nightmares by a lot by abandoning materialism and becoming a panpsychist. Then after when I 
we discovered classical theories of morality and i noticed um how stories are real uh, if we come back to a conversation oh, yeah. we had a few years back but when i noticed that stories are real uh then my nightmares again were cut down quite a bit because if you think that stories are real that moral patterns are real then you already have quite a lot of meaning in your world like you can get back a purpose you can get back um, the idea that there's progress you can make in moral terms and that makes all of life more meaningful immediately so i had quite infrequent zombie nightmares at this stage it happened once in a while but interesting so uh, this is 2020 this is when lockdown stuff was going crazy no no before before it was before it was, it was when we started the blog because yeah, it was before i i know i know because we back. we talked about no i'm saying um whenever you're at this stage where you are beginning to have infrequent zombie or there's you're starting to make progress towards not having the zombie nightmares or they're diminishing in some way uh when we talked in our first discussion about our stories real that was in response to one of the first articles that i posted on the website which would have been in either 2019 or 2020 by the time we got it started yeah but i i had already like i, I don't think i had i hadn't formulated the arguments exactly the way that we did when we spoke but uh the basic ideas i had learned a bit before because i Definitely, my my zombie problem was over before I started making YouTube videos. Um, and it was it was like I think the the step about uh, the reality of moral patterns, I had accepted by the time uh, like before doing before finishing my master's. So around I don't know six years ago maybe. Okay. Um, I uh, had very infrequent zombie nightmares, and then I spoke with Jonathan again in private at the time. Um, and uh, we found a methodological solution to the zombie problem, which is basically self-sacrifice because it's mm. you, you, zombies are also an inversion of Christianity uh, because Christianity is the strongest system of meaning. So zombies mm. end up being a parody of Christianity, especially the Christian resurrection, because they come back and they have like decaying bodies instead of glorious bodies they um like they eat always only for themselves rather mm. than uh giving gratitude to the gift that is offered to them they um like because they can't see the meaning in things they want to devour brains which are let's say the the most meaning charge material thing uh mm. but if you see the opposition in the eucharist you have the remedy like if you learn to see meaning if, if you learn to see even god in bread then you're not gonna have a problem seeing that there's meaning and spirit in mm. a body including a brain so anyway there's many parallels we can make but Christianity ends up being the antidote to the zombie problem. Uh, and it's also why the zombie problem is a parody of Christianity. But in the end, it meant that if you're stuck in a zombie story, what you must do is to do what Christ would do, which is to sacrifice himself to save the zombies. Mm. So, um, mm. To find a way to, to serve, to give up yourself, to give your gifts. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Find a way to sacrifice yourself for the people who uh, want to destroy you. And by doing that, you will become a saint and you will save those who are persecuting, persecuting you as well. So um, when I worked through that with Jonathan, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. my zombie nightmares just went away completely. Um, so that's how zombies factored in. But I didn't publish anything on zombies until um, doing a French podcast with Jonathan. That's what it was. On it yeah. around three years ago. Mm hmm so all this was happening in the background or kind of like leading up to whenever the symbolic world community became something and you became the blog editor. It was like kind of like this was leading into that season. Yeah, yeah. And I, wow, when I had I became, no idea. So interesting. When the blog came up, um, yeah, Jonathan asked me if I wanted to be the editor because he was looking for someone. 
And at that time, I was still, I think I was less than a year into my debates with John Verbeke. Um, so what ended up, ended up happening is that lots of my, this arc, like this arc of trying to respond to John's objection, uh, a lot of it happened through articles that I would publish. And then mm -hmm. John, would, John would read and then yeah. I would discuss it with, uh, with him again. That was a fun so, back and forth for a while. Yeah, yeah, and it's. I felt it like I was kind of like the the sparring partner. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Because like you'd I have a like... couple of conversations, and then we would talk and kind of like exercise some things out, and then you go back yeah. and. I mean, I wasn't the only one, but it was it was a fun time. It was. Yeah, so, yeah. I just actually, I'm I'm curious. Um, is have you had any correspondence with with John recently? Are you guys going to be striking up conversations? Going to be involved with the the course? Uh, we I think the last like recorded conversation we had was around a year ago. Um, since then, he's been really busy with mainly AI stuff and also other projects. And right. because I didn't have any like arguments to run by him anymore, I haven't been like pressing it either. Um, we, I'd say, I'd say we ended up closing that debate arc. Um, a year and a half ago, when I published that article mm. on um, on love as the answer to the problem of the intrinsic nature of thing, um, when I, when I published that, John largely agreed, um, and that sort of cemented everything. Jonathan agreed. John agreed. So I was happy. I had the metaphysics uh, that uh, worked out. So since then, I had not done lots of metaphysical research. I researched other stuff more applicable to my life. So uh, philosophy of work, uh, theology of work, that's right. something we talked about last year. Mm -hmm. But because I didn't have any new theoretical thing to run by John, uh, I didn't I didn't push it. Uh, we had one conversation about um, Christian Neoplatonism, something he was interested in for is, um, is uh, after Socrates series too. But then we couldn't make a, it happen uh, to have another one. We'll probably speak again one other day. Uh, and recorded but it just... I imagine that your your book and what you're publishing publicly uh, in the next month will probably arouse some type of attention or some some action maybe a response from mr verveke or dr verveke yeah it's possible i mean i i sent him um... i mean you can go on like a reunion tour and have a, <laughs> a few podcasts <laughs> uh... I, I sent him so far just an um like a, a pdf of the book and asked him for a blurb and he said he would write a blurb so oh that's great uh, that's good great. so maybe that will spark a conversation we'll see but i think the book has nothing that we haven't uh, i mean there's the zombie stuff that i added uh which i had i hadn't written about zombies in english but like most of the arguments I had already talked about with him. So I don't really expect that we have like a new debate arc to, to start, but yeah. uh, we might still end up like finding some, some you know, I don't know if you discuss. got a chance to listen to one of his recent talks with Peterson, but I, he definitely had a different tone of humility and an embrace of mystery, mm -hmm. which no, there's something going on. I think there there's still more chapters to be told in in mm -hmm. his journey as well. Interesting. Yeah. Well, man, it's just interesting how uh, the podcast and the articles and the debates and the back and forths have culminated into a book and a class, and it's just really it's exciting. It's exciting stuff, and. I, I'm really, really excited that we get to celebrate it together in person over in Florida next month. Yeah, too. Yeah. So, uh, man, I hope other people listening to this are inspired to to make the investment and to come join us and come say hi to us and see the book over in Florida. Looking forward to it. Please come say hi. I'm going to be happy to see you and discuss metaphysics and zombies and whatever. Yeah. Do you have any... Um, uh, activities going on? Are you on the, the itinerary for any of the events at the summit? Uh, no, no, I don't. I have nothing special planned. I think for sure at some point I'll be like somewhere selling my book, but I don't know yet how that will happen. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we, we do plan at least like if we can manage to get my book in print um, uh, for the summit, I will be at some point like publicizing and selling the book, but I don't know when that will be just yet. All right. Well, I have uh, 
uh, a new project in the works and hopefully I'll have something physical to show people then too. Nice. Nice. So we'll get to do it together, JP. <laughs> Sounds good. Forward to seeing well, mine's definitely like in prototype mode. So, um, <laughs> I, well, what I could tell people and, and update you on is just that I've pushed pause on my memoirs. Uh, mm -hmm. I made really good progress this year on writing down my journey, kind of like my mythical journey while I was on my bicycle through other countries and kind of doing some pretty extensive spiritual traveling as well and exposed to various things. I, I guess it's kind of like what you're describing, uh, your philosophical journey through the meaning crisis. This would be like my spiritual journey uh, through the meaning crisis as well, um, and finding finding my resolution in that, mm -hmm. where I least wanted to find it. Um, so anyway, I I made good progress on that this year, but then uh, I rekindled my uh, investigation into the arrival story, mm -hmm. and I find that it's a good opportunity for me to. Uh, continue to come out with uh, eight or so uh, chapters and yep. several of these I hope would be uh, suitable for the symbolic world blog I think so yeah. that way people can you know be able to engage with it and uh, especially leave some comments and get some feedback on it uh, have those turn into video essays and then wrap up all those chapters um, I the reason why I'm interested in doing a book book version is because these chapters really build on each other. And so they're not like just these standalone articles of like, Hey, I have an observation about the movie here. And I, th I see mm -hmm. it tying to, you know, Pentecost and Babel and Exodus and Genesis over here. It's like, no, there's actually this cool thread that's developed as I've been outlining and, and drafting the articles. So uh, I'm working with another member in the symbolic world who uh, is quite the craftsman and is really into mm -hmm. book binding. And so oh, nice uh he's uh, i i shared the idea with him and he became inspired to uh to turn these into a, uh a, what i consider a work of art in the form of a, a bound book so uh that's all kind of coming together last minute and it's kind of thrilling and exciting and we'll see if we can have something ready by the summit so people have a, a I'm, I'm really excited about the physical tangible face to face and so i'm kind of putting a rush on having something where it's like, Hey, this thing, it's not going to happen until later, but like, you want to hold it, you know? <laughs> so, uh, anyway, awesome. so that's coming up. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, JP, man, did you have any other thoughts, anything else you wanted to share about the course or the book? No, no, that's good. I'd say, um, don't hesitate to register. It starts on the 24th. Uh, you can join later too. Um, lessons are going to be recorded and hopefully come and meet us in person and get a book okay sounds good all right jp until next time my friend i look forward to seeing you bye derek